You're ready for a bit of wandering, because I'm going to be all over the place this morning. Can everybody good. hear me all right? Good, good. Um, yeah, this morning we're going to look at uh, the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. Um, this is a really sort of interesting parable, and as, as I was kind of uh, thinking about what to speak on, and just, uh, I was pondering it, and I came across it and thought it's a really good parable sort of to talk about and uh, just sort of expound upon the word. Just, uh, just sort of see what it says to us. It seems a really basic parable. There's quite a lot in there that I tend to miss when I read over it. It's one of those things that you read it, you understand what it is, and then you sort of skim past it. Um, it reads... To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance He wouldn't even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and all those who humble themselves will be exalted. Um, The first thing to note here is to look at who Jesus is talking about. uh, Talking to, sorry. I always assumed that he was talking to the Pharisees. I thought that... Jesus was talking to the religious leaders because they were kind of like um, they, they were kind of smug and confident of themselves. But when you look at the, the text, it mentions that Jesus uh, to some who were confident of their own righteousness. It's not not the religious leaders that Jesus was talking to. It was those who were self righteous. Uh, and the thing about self righteousness is it's completely kind of subjective. You don't have to be morally or spiritually righteous in order to be self-righteous and conversely you don't need to be um, you know you don't seem you don't need to have you can have seem to have uh, religious or social righteousness whilst being self-righteous you know what I mean it's like it's something that you can quite easily have um, if you ask anybody who isn't aware of what the church is anybody who's not involved in the church you ask a hundred people what their first thought of the church is, what what their first, you know, if you said to 100 people, say the first thing that springs into your mind when I say the word church, not, you know, there, there wouldn't be that many of them that went, oh, it's really loving, they're always willing to give, they're quite happy to just lay down their lives for everybody else. It's usually like self-righteousness hypocrites, you know, they, 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 they seem to like hold themselves up to this, on this pedestal and look down on everybody else. Um, it, it's, it, it's sort of, that's a sad state of affairs, really, and it's this, um, it's this point that Jesus was addressing 2,000 years ago, and it's still something that affects the church today. It's still something that um, we, we might be the most loving and the most giving fellowship on the planet, but unless we're showing the outside world that, unless we're doing that, we're still seeming self-righteous because we're only doing it for ourselves. We're only doing it to ourselves. Um, it's absolutely, it's, this is a cracking piece of scripture, and I love Luke's gospel because it's arranged in such, a, in such an odd manner, and he puts things together in ways that don't seem to be, um, uh, it just, just seems peculiar when you first read through it, but it's, um, it's got some really good stuff in it. If we read on from this, uh, the, the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector, there is, um, uh, it talks about Jesus and the truth, I'll read it to you. It says, um, People were also bringing babies to Jesus for him to place his hands on them. When the disciples saw this, they rebuked them. But Jesus called the children and said to him, uh, sorry, and said, Let the little children come to me and don't hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God God like a child will never enter it. And then the text goes on to talk about a rich uh, the rich in the kingdom of God. Uh, verse 18, it says, A certain ruler asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Um, Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. 
you know the commandments, you shall not you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, honour your father and mother. All these I have kept since I was a boy, he said. Uh, when Jesus heard this, he said to him, You still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give it to the poor, and then you will have treasure in heaven, and then come and follow me. When he heard this, he became very sad because he was very wealthy. Jesus looked at him and said, How hard is it for the rich to enter the kingdom of God? In, indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard this asked, Who then can be saved? Jesus replies, What is impossible with human beings is possible with God. Peter said to him, We have left all to follow you. Truly I tell you, Jesus said to him, No one who has left home or wife or brother or sister or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God will fail to receive many times as much in this age and in the age to come eternal life. So it, there's these two um, two things that follow on after this uh, parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. And one of them is about little children and one of them is about um, the rich, uh, rich um, trying to enter into, into the kingdom of heaven, this rich ruler. And these things, these, this follows what we have to do to become saved. These things we have to do to enter the kingdom of heaven is we have to um, come to God as little children with no preconceived ideas. Um, we need to uh, renounce everything and follow Jesus. Uh, this is after humbling ourselves, which is the, the power of the Pharisee and the tax collector. So we read through these uh, three sort of sections of Luke's Gospel and it, it gives us an example of what we need to do to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Um, coming to God as little children with no preconceived ideas. You know, this the preconceived ideas is where um, the majority of problems arise in modern in the modern Christian world. We have a tendency to analyse and process um, the Bible with a top-down approach. We come to the Bible with a specific idea and then we read read the text to try and make it fit our preconceived idea. Whereas we should be coming to it with a bottom-up approach is where it goes to the scriptures and we read them and then that alters the way that we we are, that alters our ideas. But there are, there's lots of things that um, the top-down approach, coming to the Bible with a preconceived idea, it can cause problems. There's lots of uh, lots of issues and lots of confusing things that, that arise from it, um, like the deity of Mary and all sorts of stuff has come from people looking at the scripture with a preconceived idea and then trying to make it fit, you know, jamming it into a box. And it, it doesn't tend to work. And renouncing everything to follow Jesus, that's, um, in the case of the ruler in the text, that was uh, him renouncing his riches, but it can be anything that we hold higher in our hearts than Jesus. It can be anything at all. It can be, uh, um, it, it, can be uh, it can be absolutely anything. It doesn't need to be physical riches. Um, just to point out, these three examples, they're, they're all people who are following the law. They're all people who are doing things right. The Pharisee was following the law. You know, when he was he was uh, went to pray, the Pharisee followed the law. The disciples that rebuked the people for bringing children to Jesus were just doing the right thing. You know, if somebody's preaching to them, somebody's talking to them, and then loads of people come up and go, "Kiss my baby, kiss my baby, kiss my baby." <laughs> and they stop, hang on a second, let him finish. And Jesus is like, "No, bring them to me." They're, they're, they're just doing what will be um, what will be expected. And uh, the rich man had followed all of the commandments since he was a boy. Uh, so we need to be aware that, you know, this following the law, I'm going to look at it a bit later on in a moment with the, the, uh, the tax collector, it's not, that's not everything. You know, it's not, it, we need to do more than um, just following the rules they're written down. We need to um, love other people is what it boils down to, realistically. They're kind of, the majority of Christian the, the, the Christian life comes from just loving one another. That would be, you know, you could just, I could stand here and say, love one another, love everybody, and that would be a sermon preach, and everybody could kind of like, um, you could live off that, you know. Uh, we're looking at humbling ourselves, so let's look at the, the tax collector and the Pharisee. Um, there's this um, idea in. Uh, in, well, there's lots. There's lots of. We were talking about it 
came up an analysis of it. It was, it was mentioned beforehand somewhere or other, but somebody asked, is there a scale of sin? And it was a passing, it wasn't actually a, a question that was asked, but it was in a passing sort of statement, you know, um, uh, the scale of sin. And we can talk about evidence for and against all, you know, you can look it up, there's all sorts of evidence about the sin scale. But basically, the only um, difference in sin, which is outlined in Matthew 7, 3, is uh, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention pay no attention to the plant in your own. So it's, that, that's how we should view sin, that's the sin scale. And I think that's a, that's a good way to measure um, sin, is the fact that everybody else's sin is worse than ours. You know, when, we're, uh, if, when we look at people and we look at the outside world, uh, sorry, our sin is worse than everybody else's. <laughs> so, um, our, our sin is worse than everybody else's. When we look at the outside world, that... Um, our sin, the things that we do, the way that we act and the way that we behave is, is worse than everybody else's and should be more obvious to us than everybody else's. If I, had a, if I had a speck in one hand and a plank in the other, I'm pretty sure you'd say, Dave, why are you holding a piece of wood? Not Dave, why are you holding a speck? And uh, that, that's how we should be. You know, you can come into the church, a, a drug dealer, a thief, a murderer, and I should view my sins as worse than yours. And that, that, that's how, um, that, that's how the, the church should be. So the Pharisees and the tax collector, these, these two guys, and they go to pray. Um, Pharisees were a religious sect. Um, they were noted for their strict observance of the law and the traditions of the elders. Um, they, they followed not only the written law, but a spoken verbal law as well, that they considered just as good as the written law. Um, it consisted mostly of middle class businessmen, so they were kind of in touch with the common man. Tax collectors were considered by the Pharisees to be traitors and extortioners. Extortioners because they um, collected more than was required for personal gain, although that was how they got paid. That was how they got their wages, they had to take a commission. Although so I don't doubt lots of them took more than they needed to, but it's, uh, that was just uh, the way that it worked. And they were considered traitors because they. Uh, while the Jews, while they were Jews, they represented uh, Rome, which was the occupying power. Um, the Pharisees' prayer wasn't so much a prayer, but a brag. It kind of, he kind of, thank you, Lord, for making me as awesome as I am. Is what he did. He, 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 he prayed that he's not like other men. He's not an extortioner. He's not unjust. He's not an adulterer. He's not like this tax collector. He fasts twice a week. He pays his tithes. Um, how many of us have prayed prayers like that? And not like, not, not intentionally looking at other people, but so there, there is a small part of the human heart that comes in and says, well, I've not been that one this week. At least I've not done this. So at least, at least I didn't want to be over to church. <laughs> we, there is a small part of us that does that when we come to pray. And it's like, it, it happens so naturally. We don't even realise it sometimes. And it, it does. It's not necessarily personal. Like at least, at least I'm not as bad as Scott falling asleep in church. But <laughs> sorry, you're just there. So, oh, oh, no. so, so at awful. least I can stay awake through a sermon. But uh, no, it's not always. It's not personal like that. But it is. Um, we do tend to do that. At least I've not committed this sins this week. Or at least I've been better than last week. Or at least I've not done this. And it, it's just something that comes natural, doesn't it? It's, um, it's just something that we do. Um, the, the, the Pharisee was doing everything that the law required. Um, he was doing more, in fact. The law required one annual fast. That's in Leviticus. It mentions that you should, this should be a lasting ordinance for you. On the tenth day uh, of the seventh month, you must deny yourselves and not do any work with a native born or foreigner among you. He tithed once a week. Uh, sorry, he fasted. Um, he fasted once a week, you know, he, twice a week, sorry. It, he was doing more than was needed to. The law required only tithing of certain items. You only needed to tithe, um, sh- what do we need to tithe? Grain, uh, wine, and oil, and the first burn of your, the first born of your herds and flocks is what you needed to tithe. He tithed everything that he had. He was doing more than, um, <coughs> He was doing more than the law required him to do. Um, The tax collector said seven words in his prayer. God have mercy on me, a sinner. Compared to the 34 that the Pharisee said, 
And the results were polar opposites. You know, the, the tax collector went home justified before God, and the Pharisee just went home. Um, it does this parable is actually, but it doesn't really need uh, a vast explanation. It's one of those parables. It's not. It, it's not. It doesn't. It, there's no like mysticism about it. There's nothing um, too difficult to understand. It's not a parable that Jesus told to um, his disciples while he was all sectioned off. It was kind of like. He told it to the people that needed to hear it. It's basically saying, you know, humble yourselves. Um, the way that we approach prayer and the way that we deal with others, we should um, behave like this tax collector. Um, the Pharisee should have been um, should have been aware of, you know, the, the words of Solomon in Proverbs 8:13. It says. Fear, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil, which is cool. Thank, thank you, I'm not a tax collector. But pride and arrogance and the evil way uh, and the perverse mouth I hate, uh, he missed out those things. And pride and arrogance is bad for us. Proverbs 16, 18 said, Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Proverbs 29, 20, uh, 29 23 said, A man's pride will go before life. But the humble in spirit will retain honour. There's, you know, the Bible's full of not being proud. Um, there, there is a section uh, when uh, Jesus is talking about the rich in the kingdom of God, and uh, it dawned on me as I was sort of uh, panning through it earlier on. And uh, in, in verse 28, Peter says something. You know, when Jesus says, um, uh, "Let me see." Those who saved said, "Who then?" Uh, those who heard, sorry, said, "Who then can be saved?" And Jesus replies, "It's impossible for human beings, but all things are possible with God." Uh, Peter asked him. Uh, Peter said to him, "Sorry, we have left all, and we have uh, uh, sorry, we have left all we had to follow you." Peter is making this boast here. Peter is kind of Peter is almost doing the same as the tax collector did here. Dawned on me about five ten minutes ago. I just flicked through this and thought, Peter is saying. Exactly what the tax collector is doing. There's a difference here because Peter is boasting in Jesus. Peter is doing that. It's the same boast, and Peter's always the first one to kind of open his mouth and say something. Nine times out of ten, is to put his foot in it, but he does open his mouth and he says, "You know, we have left all we had to follow you." And it's almost a boast. I don't know whether it's a complaint or a boast. I'm not entirely sure. You can't tell with the way that he. Maybe both. You know, oh, we've left everything. But that, that there's a massive difference there in. Peter, who is boasting in Jesus. Peter is saying, you know, we've left everything we have to follow you. And it was, it, it's, it's a selfless boast. He's boasting in Christ and thinks that um, he is boasting in, in Jesus. And there, there's a massive difference there. Although it seems similar, you know, the tax collector's like, look at all the cool stuff I've done. Whereas Peter's like, but we have done this. It's, it's, um, it's totally different, and that's where that's where we should be. You know, all of that uh, natural pride and natural arrogance that we manage to harbour up, and so something that comes so naturally to us, um, can be focused into um, boasting in Jesus. You know, it's um, me and Rachel talking about it on the walk to church on Friday after we've been door to door, and uh, we are. Um, we were just wondering back, we were talking about the fall and about the corruption of things and um, parasites. I'm going to say, I'm t- I've talked about parasites, I'm thinking about them recently. I think it was uh, uh, Stephen Fry said something ludicrous on telly and um, he said that he, 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 he basically, somebody asked him what, would he, what he would say if he met God and Stephen Fry just said he'd tell him that he was horrible for all these things that he created. And, um, Stephen Fry mentioned parasites and cancer and all of this stuff. And realistically, all of these nasty things, all of these horrible things that we see, parasites that feed off other people, is basically a corruption of um, something that is used for good. You know, when a, when, when a mother has a baby, that baby feeds off her like a parasite. Uh, it's, it's a corruption of that that we see um, grizzly parasites that lay eggs in people's eyes. Uh, you know, natural growth, the way that our bodies grow and heal, it's a corruption of that that causes cancer. It's the same process, it's just 
corrupted. And um, before I was going with this, got somewhere with it, but I was looking at talking probably about on the way back on Friday about the fall. Yeah, we were looking at. Um, yeah, there we go. We should take that um, natural boasting that we do, that uh, prideful arrogance stuff that comes in our hearts naturally, and it's, it's something that doesn't need to be taught. The kids can do it. Yana can do it before she can walk. You know, it just comes naturally boasting in ourselves. And it's something that we should be putting into worshiping God. We should be putting into um, uh, boasting in Jesus. But because of the con- it's a consequence of the fall that it's been corrupted, and we end up. Um, using it for our own gain is where I was going with that. <laughs> so the parable of that Pharisee and tax collector, if I want you to take one thing home from this today, I'd like you to take the uh, um, don't be boastful. That's pretty much it. It's not, um, it's not a rocket science parable. It's not something that you need to um, delve into the Greek or Aramaic and look at all the different words and see what you could possibly mean by that because it's written there in massive, like, Write it. You might as well spray paint it on the walls. Don't be boastful. Um, you know, humble yourselves. Uh, think of others as more important than yourselves. Which it sounds easy, and it's easy to do. It's so easy to say. Esteem others higher than yourselves. But when it comes down to it, it really, really isn't that easy to do. When somebody says, "Hey, Dave, can you do this for me?" and I'm like, "Actually, I'm tired." <laughs> I get a phone call, can you do this? I'm like, no, pyjamas. <laughs> really? I've only just sat down. I'm like, I've not had five minutes to myself today. It's really, it's really difficult to, um, to, to do that. It, I just made it sound like I'm really, really busy. I think you get phone calls. It rarely happens. <laughs> there, there are opportunities, there, there are um, occurrences that happen, you know. Sometimes when that happens to us, and we're basically like, oh, no. And we do put ourselves first, and it's really easy to do. Uh, and it's, it's so easy to say, let's esteem others higher than ourselves, but um, it, it's, it's quite hard. It, it's, it's hard to put into practice. Um, you know, in, the, in this parable, the Pharisee praises somebody who doesn't need forgiveness and doesn't get any, and the tax collector praises somebody who needs forgiveness and he receives it. Um, we need forgiveness as Jesus' disciples. I was thinking about this the other day as well, um, you know, about the need for confession. All these old things come up, and uh, confession of sin, and how, you know, the cross has dealt with all of our sin, you know, past, present, and future, and this, when we confess sins, and when we confess to, to God and ask for forgiveness, it's not in a, it's not forgiveness in a legal standpoint, but it's forgiveness in a, uh, in a, in a family standpoint, it's forgiveness in a father and son standpoint, it's the same way as, you know, if Yana does something or if Seth does something, can they ask, you know, I, I can know they've done something wrong by the look on their face, and I've already forgiven them for it, but, you know, if they feel better when they've said, I've done this, and I go, okay, don't worry about it. And it's, it, it's for them more than it is uh, for me. Uh, and that's basically what it is, you know, when we confess our sins to God, is to help us to understand that we're forgiven. Um, but we do need forgiveness. We need to walk with this forgiveness um, within our hearts. Because we are all sinners. Um, 1 John um, uh, 1, 8 to 10 says, If we say that we don't have sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, uh, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. We're all sinners. We all stumble, and we all fall. We all kind of, uh, and we do. We do. We need to remember that when dealing with each other, uh, and when dealing with the outside world, we should. Uh, we need to alter the perception of the church, not change the church to fit what the outside world wants, because. Um, we need to stand out as a light, but we need to change the way the outside world sees us, and we need to uh, we need to get out there as being something that changing the view that church is this self-serving sort of like you know ant colony where we all kind of have our jobs and we all do it. We don't really involve the outside. We need to really get um, get the world outside to be aware of just how much um, 
the church has to offer. I know there is so much love in this room. I know how much each of you are willing to, you know, give yourselves in order to help others. But do the outside world know that? Do the people outside know that? And it can be, it's not frustrating, but you can see, you can feel the potential of the room when you get the body together on a Sunday morning. The place hums with potential and it's got this vibrating, it's like, get excited about it. And it's something that we need to start, you know, opening up and getting out and seeing people outside in the world and just shaking things up a bit. We can become stale sometimes, can't we? I think that's, uh, that's the problem. I was watching something the other day, it might have been a documentary of some sorts, about a church in Cambodia, somewhere, I think. And uh, this guy is running this church and it's absolutely massive, it's brilliant. And the way that he's got, the, the, way, the thing that he's put it down to, is giving kids responsibility. I was looking at this, this video and he was doing this, um, the Sunday school was run by children. I thought, that's absurd. <laughs> you can't let the kids run Sunday school. And they have kids that lead, you know, like the 8 to 12 year old groups, they have 8 to 12 year old leaders. And he said, you know, how can you expect the kids to trust something if you feel it's above them? How can you expect the kids to um, believe in something that you hold above them and say you won't be able to understand it yet? And this church is like buzzing and the kids really love it. It's just little things like just altering the way that we view um, others. Just because the outside world is quite, um, you know, people outside the church are so willing to accept what we've got. We, we've got quite, we, you know, we, we have quite a lot to offer as Christians. You know, we've got, um, you know, eternal life and salvation solid. It's, it's a relatively good deal and you can get it for free. It's not like you're like you peddling vacuum cleaners door to door. It's, like, it's, it's um, We've got so much to offer and I think we need to realise the potential of what we have as Christians. And um, when we start to do that, we'll start to feel more of a, um, I don't know, a, a thirst to share it out there and a thirst to get out. I'm not saying everybody needs to go out and do door to door, everybody needs to go out and in the summer and do open air because not everybody's called to that. But we've got, I've got family who aren't in the church and I don't take as many opportunities as I can to um, speak to them about Jesus and just the sake of not upsetting them really. And I see that's something, that, that's something that I need to change myself. It's one of those things that I need to start, you know, they'll talk about church, but they'll bring it up. I think I should do uh, I need to alter that. I need to start being the one that brings it up and saying, hang on a second, I do this. And basically, if I do it with love, they can't get upset with me. If I offer to make them a cup of tea and then do it while I'm doing that, you know, that that they can't, it's, it's that kind of, we've all got somewhere we can be working, regardless of where we are, who we've come from, or what we're doing. There, we all have a job to do. The kids in Sunday school have a job to do. And we, we've all got somewhere that we could be sharing this wonderful love that we've got. Um, we need to be praying. And this, this will all stem from this prayer that the tax collector said, have mercy on me, I'm a sinner. Um, you know, uh, David sinned. Psalm 51 says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. Uh, for I acknowledge my transgression. Um, my sin is always before me. You know, David is described in the Bible as a man after God's own heart. And that seems like something he... It seems, um, yeah, that's King David. He made some massive slip-ups. He made some, like, genuinely huge mistakes from adultery and then trying to cover it up. But he was just, he, it just wasn't very nice. That whole sort of chapter, it, it's not great. It's not ideal. And you think, hang on a second, how can he be after God's own heart? He slept with somebody else's wife. He then got drunk and tried to, like, convince him that the baby was his, you know, like, go and spend the night with your wife. And he was like... This poor guy is like, no, I'm going to stand my king. Why should I go my wife? And then he goes and sends him off to get killed. It's like, it, it, it just, it doesn't seem right. But the reason he's a man after God's own heart is because of this prayer, have mercy on me. I'm a sinner. And that's all it takes, this um, realisation that we need God to be able to move forward. We need to... Um, be aware that it's Jesus 
who has cleansed our sins. You know, he, took, he paid the price for you know, We can't, like, um, the tax, uh, like the Pharisee, we can't tithe our way out of, sin, uh, out of sin. We can't fast our way out of sin. We can't, you know, well, well I've sinned, so I'm going to tithe twice as much this week. Or, well, I've, I've sinned, so I'm going to fast on Tuesday because then God will forgive me. It's not, that's not how it works. We can't boast our way out of it. We can't compare our way out of it. We can't say, well, I've sinned, but this person's worse than me. We need Jesus. And it, we just need to come to him and say, Lord, I'm a sinner. Forgive me. And that's what it takes. Um, when we come to God with that attitude, the, our whole Christian world will alter. The way that the world views us will alter. The way that... Um, People, you know, the way that the outside world views how effective the church is, how much we uh, we can show the love of Jesus, it, it'll alter because they'll be aware of it. They'll, they'll be able to see um, this humility in us, and it's that it's that humility that lifts us up to Christ, and it's that humility that they'll it, it welcomes people in. People don't want to go to places where they feel um, like an outcast. They don't want to go to places where they feel like um, they're not good enough. And unfortunately, loads of people do. This, you know, the church is a... We know the church is a circus full of runaways and, you know, cast outs. And we've all done something ridiculously wrong. This is what the church is. It is a place for the strays and the runaways and the abandoned to come. But... The outside doesn't know that, and there is a world that's sort of, it's, it's dying, and there's all sorts of things. Um, on this, uh, this documentary I watched the other day, it was about, uh, this, this uh, pastor was saying, he was talking about his church, he was talking about a dream, yeah, and he said, I had this dream, uh, that my church, he was in his church, and it was just full of, uh, you know, people dealing drugs and people fighting and people having sex on the pews. It was just a complete mess. And uh, he, he said, I stood up and I said, if you're not going to respect God's house, get out. And uh, then Jesus spoke to him in this dream and said, why are you sending away what you've asked for? And uh, he said, I didn't ask for this, you know, and Jesus said, you asked for the lost. And that's what it is. You know, people who are lost just... That's what they default to. I used to do it. I used to be on all sorts of drugs. I used to, uh, uh, I used to be a right reprobate. I used to steal things. I used to be horrible. You wouldn't have, you know, you wouldn't have spoken to me before because I, I was absolutely horrible. And it was because I was lost. It was because I was looking for something that was God-shaped and nothing else in this world is. And that's why that's that's why the world is full of sin. It's because it's lost. And we need to really get that. Um, get that into our um, walk and become aware of that as we go out and about and do our Christian thing. I'll close, um, I'll close in prayer. And, uh, I'd just like you to take away this week, if you're going to take something away, just take away this being humble. And not, um, you know, being humble in a, uh, in a Lord have mercy on me, I'm a sinner's way, you know. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you that you are a God who is there for us. Father, we thank you that you sent your Son to die so that we could have eternal life. And Lord, we pray that you help us to be humble. Heavenly Father, we pray that you help us to have an attitude like the tax collector. Father, we pray that you help us to come to you with humble hearts. Lord, help us not to be boastful. Father, we pray that every um, corrupt seed in our bodies, Lord, everything that would have us um, compare ourselves to others, Lord, or lift ourselves up based on uh, other people or based on um, events that have happened. Father, we pray that you stop that. Heavenly Father, we pray that you come into our hearts, Lord, and turn 
all of that pride and arrogance that we have naturally into uh, a boasting about what Jesus has done for us. Heavenly Father, we pray that you make us uh, a beacon of light to the world outside. Father, we pray that people who walk in will feel the love that you have given us, Lord. Father, we pray that we can be uh, we can show people that love that you've shown us. Heavenly Father, we pray that you help us to become vessels of that. And Lord, we pray that you help us to pour that love out upon all who come into this building, Lord, and upon all we meet throughout our week, Lord. We pray that the world outside um, the, the fellowship of the church will see something different about us. They'll see something confusing and they'll want to know why are you so nice? Why is there so why is why do you love everybody the way that you do? And we'll be able to say it's because Jesus first loved us. And we can show that love to others. Heavenly Father, we pray this in Jesus' name.